Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's really, it's really fun to get to, you know, uh, connect with everyone virtually. Uh, so I'm Abby, I joined Boston University as an assistant professor uh, three months ago in January. Uh, so today, I will be talking about work done during my postdoc at Princeton. Uh, this is the cast of characters I did this work with. I want to particularly highlight uh, Caroline Adkins, who was a terrific undergraduate at the time working in Suji Data's group, who is now a graduate student at Stanford. So before I get started, I want to uh, say a few words about my group uh, just to introduce myself. So we will work in three main areas. One of these areas is obstructed growth and expansion, and that's what I'll be telling you a little bit about today. Uh, we're also really interested in uh, the statistical physics of metamaterials. You know, how do we understand metamaterial behavior through the lens of these statistical uh, mechanics models, such as we're interested in building mechanical Ising models and have, I did some work on this during my PhD with David Nelson. Uh, we're also really interested in bridging soft matter and the geosciences. And we've worked on pro projects with oceanographers related to ecological competition and turbulent fluids. So these projects have a very broad range, but they're all connected by their use of simple models for complex behavior and our effort to connect theory, simulation, and experiment whenever we can. So let's jump right into this uh, first batch of questions. What is obstructed growth and expansion and why are we interested in it? So when I say obstructed growth and expansion, I'm thinking of a system that would like to increase in size for some reason, uh, but it's prevented from doing so by external obstacles. So this is a really ubiquitous type of behavior in everyday life. Uh, a uh, example I'm particularly fond of is that of muffins during baking. You know, muffins have a very characteristic shape, and this is a result of obstructed expansion. Uh, other everyday examples you might think of could include you know, root-bound house plants or even biofilms growing in the small spaces of our teeth. Uh, there are many examples of obstructed growth and expansion in important medical and industrial systems as well. Uh, one example that's very rich is a medical intervention for a partially blocked blood vessel. So here we see this narrowed blood vessel and we've inserted uh, this device that then inflates. So this is a, a balloon that inflates and then it props open this metal mesh tube that then opens up this blood vessel. So that's one example of obstructed expansion that happens very quickly. Uh, but a more I would, I would say interesting, definitely more insidious type of obstructed expansion occurs in the months following the stent placement. If you observe a cross section of the artery, uh, in about 20% of cases following a bare metal stent placement, you'll see that the uh, tissues will grow around uh, the struts of this metal mesh tube. So here the stent components are marked by asterisks and it will re-narrow the vessel and often require further intervention. So, uh, you know, in both of these cases, we have a growing body prevented from assuming its preferred shape. And whenever we have expansion around obstacles, we expect stresses to develop fairly generally. Those stresses can then influence future expansion in both living and non-living systems, as I've shown. And so we need to understand the location and the magnitude of these growth-induced stresses in confined environments if we're interested in ultimately developing predictive models of complex growth processes of any kind. However, despite how ubiquitous this phenomenon is, it's it's still difficult to find a system in which it's it's easy and accessible to look at the resulting stresses from this from this phenomenon. So our question that we asked was, can we build the simplest system possible that would allow us to systematically study the stresses that build up due to obstructed expansion? If we were able to do this, we could then ask questions, you know, like, does this behavior have general features that we might expect to hold in other setups like the muffin or the artery? And you know, maybe we would find some general behavior, maybe we wouldn't, but uh, this is our, this is the goal that we set out to do with this project. Uh, and also let me say that I'm uh, happy to take questions at the end, but I'm also happy to take questions throughout. So if something is unclear, please feel free to jump in. I can just adjust how much I cover um, as we go. So in order to figure out, in order to build a simple system, our first thought was to turn to hydrogels. So uh, many of you may be familiar with hydrogels. Briefly, they are cross-linked polymer networks that when they're put in contact with water, they can swell sometimes very dramatically. This expansion is favored by the entropy of mixing the polymer and water molecules, and it's opposed by the elasticity of the network. So microscopically, we can think of a polymer network with some number of water molecules that is stretched as more and more water molecules enter. When allowed to swell in isolation, these two forces will eventually balance at some value of the water content. And the hydrogel will go from this initial size that I'll call R init to some equilibrium size that I'll be calling R star. And this is to scale for the hydrogels that we work with in the experiments that I'll show you in a second. Uh, we have an R star that is approximately six times the initial uh, radius. 
So this ability of hydrogels to absorb and retain waters is a key property of hydrogels, and it's critical for many of the places where we apply hydrogels uh, in our society. So hydrogels are used to absorb and retain water in diapers and contact lenses, and they're also uh, used as a soil additive to support agriculture in drought-prone regions. So this type of application would involve mixing in dry hydrogel beads with a soil with the hope that they will absorb rainwater and then act as miniature water reservoirs. So the swelling, of course, is occurring in a loaded granular medium, uh, which forces the hydrogel to conform around soil particles as it expands. And this process has been really beautifully imaged uh, in the data lab uh, prior to this work and modeled uh, in the Atherton group as well. And so you can see, again, really complicated morphologies arising from obstructed expansion. So to summarize this uh, somewhat long introduction to the problem, hydrogels are a really good material for us to use to create a prototypical system to explore obstructed expansion since they're clearly able to swell very dramatically. And as a bonus, due to their many applications, I would argue that the specific problem of obstructed hydrogel swelling is also independently interesting. Great, so we have our expansion. Now we just need our obstruction. So what we do is we take our hydrogel bead and we put it in a obstacle array. So here we have 3D printed obstacles so we can tune their size and shape and we've uh, we've connected them, we've fixed them to acrylic plates. So now we conducted the simplest experiment that we could imagine. What we do next is we take this hydrogel bead, we put it in the center of the obstacle array, we put a camera focus on the top plate and we just watch and see what happens. So that's what I'll be showing you about. So here we go. Uh, we have this hydrogel swelling. Initially, it's a little unfocused since it hasn't made contact with the top plate yet. We see these really beautiful cusps, these petal-like lobes. Um, that's a transient structure that's well understood. As water travels through the hydrogel, the outer portion swells before the core, uh, leading to these compressive transient stresses in the formation of cusps. Those transient stresses disappear, and then we get to stresses that will remain in equilibrium as the hydrogel encounters the obstacles uh, and uh, swells around them. And uh, this uh, deformation due to the obstacles will eventually balance the swelling uh, stresses and we will reach some equilibrium shape. So uh, as a comment, there are many classic experiments where hydrogel swelling is studied under the influence of constraints. Uh, it's most Many of those studies uh, consider the case where the hydrogel is actually fixed to a surface. So many of these studies where uh, folks look at uh, swelling instabilities include a very different kind of boundary condition. Uh, this case that we're looking at where the hydrogel is free to navigate uh, around obstacles has received comparatively less attention. So I think this is already a pretty exciting video. I think there's a lot of questions we could ask. We'd say, you know, how far does this extend? What shape does it make? How might this change if we made the obstacles rougher? But I think you'll agree with me that something much more interesting happens if we move the obstacles a little bit closer together. So now I'm showing you the same exact video. The obstacles are just a little closer. I'll speed it up a little bit. If you haven't noticed, these, these, these occur over very long times. They're not fast processes. And now if you direct your attention to the top right, you'll see a crack forms and the hydrogel will tear itself apart. It will have this very dramatic multi-stage fracturing process. So this was really exciting to us because we set out to study swelling-induced stresses, and this is pretty dramatic evidence that there are significant swelling-induced stresses that build up in the system. Uh, it also, you know, it's possible it has implications for other applications of hydrogels, and it's something that, you know, folks who have worked with hydrogels in the lab, you know, are, are not terribly surprised by since these materials can be, can be very brittle. Uh, but this is a really nice, uh, platform where we can study that systematically and specifically the contribution from this dynamic swelling process itself. So to understand this, we started varying the parameters on these obstacles. So I've already shown you two different obstacle separations. So I'm gonna call that distance our center, the distance is this inscribed circle between the obstacles. So I've shown you two different values of what I'll call our center. I could you know, continue to vary that parameter. The other parameter we're gonna vary is the radius of the obstacle. So we can make these bigger or smaller while keeping the Re distance to reach an obstacle the same. Uh, we could, of course, change the number of obstacles, the shape of the obstacles. We could change a lot of things, but this is a, this is where we started. And what we can do is for each of these obstacle configurations, we will run that same experiment again and just track, does it fracture or not? This is just to give us a coarse grained view of what is happening in the system. And here's the picture that we find. So from left to right, the obstacles are getting farther apart. So here we have small obstacles close together. Here we have small obstacles far apart. And here we have large obstacles that are far apart. And every time we have fracture, I plot an X. And every time we have no fracture, I plotted this square. Does this agree with our intuition or does it contradict it? So from left to right, I think it makes a lot of sense. I'm moving the obstacles closer together. That's increasing the stress in the system. What about the trend from top to bottom? That we have 
big obstacles more likely to less likely to induce fracture than small obstacles close together. We find that it really depends who you ask if this agrees with your intuition or not. Uh, we found that some people that are uh, thinking about the poor space available to hydrogel, which I think is a common framework to think about uh, this system if you if you're thinking about soils and if you're thinking about granular systems, uh, the pore size available to the hydrogel, uh, is much larger with these smaller obstacles than it is with these larger obstacles. So you might think the hydrogel has more space to expand in. You know, you won't have as much stress. It's it's surprising that these obstacle that these uh, smaller obstacles are inducing more fracture. On the other hand, if your if your intuition is more based on fracture mechanics, or if you you know are a use knives, <laughs> another way to put it, you, you you know, sharp things are what's really likely to induce fracture. So in that case, you might say this, this absolutely agrees with my intuition. Uh, it should be easier to fracture as I'm moving in this direction down the diagram. So that's our intuition, but let's go beyond intuition and see, you know, the, really the bulk of this project is, is theory and simulation. We wanted to see how do we understand where stresses are building up? How do we understand what, what leads to those stresses build up? And uh, hopefully that will tell us something about where we Think that cracks are likely to nucleate and spread. So in order to do this, we built a finite element model of our system. Uh, luckily, we are far from the first people to build a finite element model for hydrogel swelling. So I've listed some of the papers here that I ended up relying on the most. Uh, there are plenty of other works. So the main ingredients in this finite element model are an elastic free energy. Uh, this is in terms of a deformation gradient tensor that I've defined here in terms of the current configuration and the reference configuration. Uh, we have a mixing free energy, which is in terms of, uh, you know, area per solvent molecule, concentration per dry area, Flory Huggins interaction parameter. And then we couple them together by saying that the only way that, you know, this is the, uh, the only way that the, uh, size of the hydrogel will increase is by imbibing solvent. So C is proportional to the solvent, is, is the solvent concentration. And that's the only way that we're going to have volumetric changes, uh, in this material. So when we do that, we can now put all these ingredients together and I can show you what this looks like. So on the left, I'm plotting dimensionless solvent concentration uh, uh, according to this color bar here. On the right, this is what we're really gonna be focusing on. At every point, I'm going to be showing the principal stresses. So I take the eigenvectors of the stress tensor at every single point and I'm gonna plot them. They'll be perpendicular to each other. And then I'll scale them according to their eigenvalue and I'll color them here. So wherever you see blue, that will be compression. Whenever you see red, that's tension. So I'll play this and we see transient stresses building up. Those are what leads to the cusps if we were resolving this more uh, carefully. And ultimately in equilibrium, what we see is uh, compressive stresses perpendicular to the obstacles. This is what you would expect, you're pushing on it. And then we see this really interesting tension building up tangential to the obstacle. And this is what's um, really interesting to us if we're thinking about fracture, because this is what is going to allow these cracks to spread and propagate. So. Uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same exact thing I did in an experiment. I'm going to take different hydrogel obstacle configurations, and I'm just going to track what is the maximum tensile principal stress and what's the maximum compressive principal stress. So here's what a plot like that would look like. Now I've rescaled the radius of the obstacle by R star, the equilibrium hydrogel radius. So when this R center is equal to R star, that's where we have a hydrogel that swells just to the point where it just makes contact at a single point for each obstacle with the hydrogel, it's not being deformed. So there's zero stress along this line. Uh, we can do the same thing with the compressive stresses and especially with the tensile stress and also with the compressive stress, we see that this is giving us something that is qualitatively very similar to what we found in our experimental fracture diagram. Uh, for you know, various reasons where our experiments are not right now well suited to do a quantitative comparison. It's something that we're really interested in looking at uh, as you know my new group gets off the ground. But what this said to us here was we are justified in studying this uh, this simulation result and uh, and trying to do some theory about it uh, because it seems like it's it's capturing something that we also are seeing in our experiments. So zooming in just on this tension diagram, I'll now take a slice going from left to right. So here we have relatively nearby obstacles, and here are relatively separated obstacles, and I'll just plot this stress, and here's what we see there. Uh, we, we're trying to build this general understanding. We're trying to see uh, how we can really get some clarity on what's going on here. And so if I were to guess where in this plot we would be able to get an analytic theory, uh, the best guess would be somewhere around this region where there's relatively little deformation after the hydrogels have swelled. That's where we would expect our theories to apply. 
So to emphasize that, I'm going to plot one minus this value, and I'm going to plot it on a log log scale. So here's what this looks like. It's the same data. It's just replotted. So this is now my target. This is what I'd really like to come up with a theory for. So in order to do that, we can take another look at what this swelling process looks like. When these obstacles are really far apart, we see you know, solvent is equilibrating to balance these stresses. And it looks something like this. And we can compare this to another situation where we might have an indentation problem. And if we do this incremental indentation that we wait for a very a long time, we realized that in equilibrium, these two pictures are identical. There should be no difference in the solvent distribution. There should be no difference in the stresses. This is just a long time limit of an indentation problem. This is great for us because we can now apply lessons from this well-developed body of work on hydrogel indentation to understand this regime. So I'll I'll move quickly through this, but you know, basically we can solve this problem in this geometry uh, using the, solving a linear elastic problem for indentation. You know, I can write down these equations. The point of writing them down is not to go through every detail, but just to show you that they're they're not they're not beautiful equations, but I can write them down. Uh, it's a little hairy to invert them, so it's stress as a function of a denter displacement, but it's something we can do and there's no free parameters. We then linearize the hydrogel theory to extract these effective elastic parameters. Uh, this is something that uh, we can follow this nice paper for, and we can plot curves and we see what we would expect, which is as we increase displacement, uh, we see this gap between theory and simulation. Uh, increasingly at odds, uh, theory and simulation, yes. So theory lines, simulation points. So what I'm plotting here, let me take a step back, is the stress in the X direction. So that's this stress here along this middle line. So I'm plotting a slice through this point. So that's exactly where we saw the largest tension show up in our simulations, a little bit back from the indenter right around here. So that's this bump right here where we're seeing these positive stresses. That's the tension that we were so interested in understanding. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to plot the maximum over each of these lines. And we're going to see from the theory prediction, how much of this data can we explain? And we get this. So this is a little disappointing, right? We went to all that work and we're getting, we're getting just a few data points. So we might not have even able, been able, we might not have even been able to see if I hadn't plotted this on a log log scale. So, you know, we were hoping maybe linear theory, we would get a little bit more mileage out of, but that clearly isn't the case. So in order to push a little bit farther, we took a step back and said, well, what are the assumptions that went into it? Which one is breaking down first? Is there a way that we can chip away at the nonlinearity here that is clearly uh, making it difficult for us to understand these stresses? So the assumptions that went into this linear theory, you know, we, we assume that there's a linear strain tensor in that calculation. We assume that there's linear constitutive behavior uh, that follows Hooke's law. And we also assume that that effective elastic parameter calculation that we did is also something that holds across these, um, across these values, that we don't have uh, th these uh, Young's modulus as a function of strain. So what we, how we did this is we said, well, let's just break each of these assumptions one at a time and see how much more data we can capture by just including a little bit of nonlinearity rather than the full nonlinear problem. So I already showed you that we can include all three of these assumptions, build a linear model, and we have this small realm where it clearly is working, but it's not, it's not getting us very far. We can simulate a St. Benon Kirchhoff model uh, elastically and compare it to the full nonlinear hydrogel model with these coupled fields. That's relaxing assumption one, but keeping assumption two and three the same. We're putting in the effective elastic parameters, we're including linear constitutive behavior, but now we're allowing for this nonlinear strain tensor as written here. We could also do a compressible Neo-Hookian model. That's relaxing both of these assumptions, and that's really essentially testing whether this parameter, what this assumption holds. After going through this process, what we find is that actually this geometric nonlinearity alone can generate tension beyond the Non, uh, beyond the linear theory. So if I plot the results from those simulations with including this geometric nonlinearity, you know, this is one way to look at it, to look at the maximum. I could also look at the entire stress field and it has the same result that just including that geometric nonlinearity is, is now allowing us to uh, reproduce this uh, tension over a, a much, much wider range. And that's something that uh, you, you, you might think is reasonably intuitive because you know, we're looking again at the system where we see tension along this line. And this tension is seems to be generated by the hydrogel wrapping itself around these obstacles. And so you need a geometric nonlinearity anytime you have significant rotations. And so what this comparison is telling us is that it's those rotations that are really generating tension. And we can also show that this agrees by doing uh, a, an argument that shows that if you take the variational derivative of the energy with this uh, green St. Benon strain tensor, you, sh you should expect a uh, tension in the place that we see it in our simulations. and um, and that uh, gives us some qualitative understanding of where that comes from. So to keep building up our diagram, we have our linear theory working in this limited regime. We have this 
larger regime where we have a geometrically nonlinear theory. And then, and again, the, uh, another reason we're interested in this result is that this is something that should be uh, independent of different uh, ways that we might have things growing or much more independent of the way that we have things growing. This doesn't depend on the specific material nonlinearity of this um, system. And then beyond that, we would need uh, more of those material nonlinearities uh, in order to explain this third regime of behavior. We can do a similar sort of argument looking at the maximum principal compressive stress. Uh, we can look through a slice. I can plot it on a log-log scale. We have this really actually much wider regime in which the linear theory works, and we have no regime in which including a geometric nonlinearity gives us any amount of improvement. Again, the intuition behind this is that the compression that we have in the system None of it's coming from rotation. It's functionally a uniaxial compression that we're having from these obstacles. So uh, we actually never get any mileage from making this model more complicated in that way with respect to compression. Uh, we can see that this is scaling, you know, not uh, that differently. You know, you could be convinced that so, you know something like the material nonlinearity, just a uniaxial compression of a neo-hooking material, is is giving us a scaling that would be consistent with our data. So. Moving, moving through this phase diagram as, as we look through it, there is one regime that you may have been uh, wondering why I've been excluding. Uh, these points here where we have the most dramatic deformations, I hadn't been uh, putting on those plots. And that's because we have qualitatively different behavior there. Uh, when we simulated these systems, what we saw, and this is, this is um, starting not at the initial time, uh, but a little bit beyond it, what we saw was this behavior where we saw the symmetry breaking, where it would swell preferentially along one direction. This is not something we ever saw direct evidence of in our experiments. Uh, I would speculate that this is because our hydrogels were so brittle that they were fracturing before this point, uh, something that I uh, you know, I think is, um, uh, our approach has been just to focus on the stresses rather than to actually simulate the fracture process directly. Uh, but we... the, uh, so there's a clarification question from the chat. Sure. Uh, so uh, uh, this is from uh, Durabitia. So uh, you calculated eigenvalues of the strain matrix uh, from your simulations and not the experiment. Uh, is he correct? Yes. Yeah. So I'm calculating. I was actually showing the stress, uh, the stresses, not the strains. Um, but uh, yes, I'm calculating that from the simulations. We don't have uh, that data from our experiments. And uh, uh -huh. I think the question of whether or not, I see also the question of whether or not this is a 2D system. Uh, this is something that we, we're approximating as a 2D system. We think that this is, you know, we've argued that this is reasonable if we're looking at the, the mid plane between the top and bottom uh, surfaces. This would be a generalized plane strain assumption. Uh, it would be, it is one of the reasons why we don't attempt to make a quantitative comparison between experiment and our theory. We want to have, we're using these hydrogel spheres at this point. We should be able to be much more concrete about that once we're able to fabricate hydrogel cylinders and tune that geometry a little more precisely. But for the experimental data we have here, uh, we think it's a reasonable approximation. Um, and I think that's, that's the, as much as we can say. Okay. So yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so, so you I, have like, uh, you know, two more minutes. Oh yeah, I'm, this is actually my last slide. So um, we have, uh, we can track this as a order parameter and the argument I'll, I'll give you for why this happens is, you know, when we have very little deformation, uh, you know, very little confinement deformations will have to be symmetric because the stresses are relatively localized under e underneath each obstacle. Um, but when we have global, when we have the confinement so great that the stress fields are global that, you know, we, we have pretty consistent magnitudes of stresses throughout the entire profile, if we were to draw lines between there. Uh, then the decision the hydrogel is making is uh, symmetric deformation is, is more costly than picking only one diagonal and only confining it in one direction. And um, that would be the, the intuition there. Uh, I want to briefly mention that uh, these ideas about obstructed growth and expansion are things that we're really interested in applying to a broader range of material. Um, hopefully, ultimately biological materials, but even in the realm of non-living things that expand, there's a lot of work to be done. So this is a, a quick um, sneak preview of some work we're doing with the Brune Lab uh, with expanding polyurethane foams, which are initially a liquid and expand like a liquid and then ultimately have solid-like behavior. So we see here uh, polyurethane foam expanding around an obstacle and actually it lifts it a little bit at late times. And we can see that easier if we look at traces through them. 
So here are my conclusions. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we're looking at this hydrogel swelling problem and I'm happy to take questions about anything. Thanks so much. All right, let's uh, give Abby an applaud. Uh, so uh, uh, do we have any questions? Uh, currently, I don't see any questions from the chat. Uh, uh, I'm probably gonna ask one question. So from uh, you know uh, your simulations uh, and theory, am I understanding correctly? You know, uh, for the bigger um, uh, uh, you know abstracts, uh, you're essentially you know uh, having like a smaller curvature there, and so uh, the sort of uh, uh, you know uh, stress and or, or the energy related to the stress is not as concentrated around that big fat uh, obstruct. Is that the correct understanding? Yeah, I think I think that would be um, kind of the fracture mechanics intuition for you know how to draw the shape of that curve without doing an experiment. I think thinking about stress concentrations in that way ends up being the right framework for predicting what's going on. Okay, um, so it's sort of like when you have a small abstract, it's like, you know, cutting the material with a sharp scissors, right? So with a very uh, sharp curvature, right? Yeah, yeah, I, we think we think that's what's happening. Um, and, uh, and that and that agrees with all of our data. I, I, I will, I will reveal we were very surprised by it, perhaps in hindsight, we shouldn't have been but uh, we thought it would be a little bit more related to this volumetric restriction okay. from these large obstacles, because you can see less fracture, actually, sometimes when they're extremely close together and, and there's only very narrow channels through which the hydrogels can expand and we actually just robustly see less fracture of them. Uh-huh. So I also have another question like, uh, you know, uh, when you actually expect, uh, you know, this uh, asymmetric uh, expansion, uh, do you uh, expect, uh, you know, the fracture to happen maybe uh, you know, uh, in a more delayed fashion because now you have the energy kind of uh, and relax in another fact in another way i i would i i'm really interested in exploring that i think there's also simpler geometries where we can start to explore those questions about you know instabilities related to to this problem or you know hydrogels navigating essentially uh through an obstacle array uh i don't think i i don't think i know enough to really even speculate uh but we would need tougher hydrogels i think and more systematic experiments all right, so uh, we have a, a question from the chat from uh, Boris Vesman. So you assume very slow swelling. So at any time, the configuration is in equilibrium. Is that right? So when the hydrogel does not fracture, we have, we're looking at that in equilibrium and we're only looking at it at the very end. And um, uh, that is true. In these fracture problems, you still see them swelling as they start fracturing, which tells us that the solvent hasn't fully equilibrated. Uh, we don't often see there. It's close. I think it's close, and we've tried to you know calculate these numbers, and they and they look close. But you know, you you if if we if we we don't typically see, and we need to do a lot more careful experiments to really see this. But we don't typically see them swelling to equilibrium, stopping swelling, and then fracturing. It's often a combined process. So. Um, there's really interesting dynamical questions that in this talk, I completely sidestepped. I think there's this is a really rich system. But is the stress in a sort of in equilibrium? So essentially is the swelling process like much slower than the- Oh yes, yeah, yes, yeah, that is true. That is absolutely true. That given the solvent concentration, the this is happening so slow that the stress is equilibrate. Yeah, it's just that the solvents are, solvent is still diffusing. So um, okay. there's it, both is the answer, I guess. Thank you for the clarification. I also see uh, hands in the in uh, in the audience. Uh, so I I I didn't notice like who uh, raised hand first. Maybe uh, you can just unmute. Oh, Robin, you just unmute. So please go ahead. Um, actually, I think uh, Bruce was raising it first. But all right. Um, so if you take a hydrogel and you uh, force it to swell by blowing a little hole inside cavitation then there apparently is a purely geometrical nonlinearity which causes explosive uh, growth. Um, I think it's called the cavitation instability. You don't seem to see that or because I was thinking something like that was going to happen when you were, it was, it's basically what happens in a balloon if you, if you swell it, but you didn't seem to see any cavitation instability or am I wrong? Uh, no, we, yeah, I'm, 
I, I haven't seen anything like that in our simulations or our experiment. I mean, the loading is really different since this is all really driven from all the solvent is always coming from the outside. Um, but it would be interesting to see if we could figure out a way to tie the two together somehow uh, and to and to make it to make a connection there. Uh, I think that's a really interesting idea and we haven't gone down that road. S separately, if I can. Um, in the uh, 2010s in France, in the lab of in in the lab of uh, Joanne and Prost, they would have little beads on which they would grow actin gels. And then these beads would be self-propagating because they would polymerize in one direction and it would break symmetry and they would start to move. And there also, they found a pattern of compression and stretching uh, in on the same bead. So it would be it would be fun if uh, your type of analysis could be used. That was done to explain how listeria uh, moves through bacteria. It would be interesting to use your method of analysis for understanding how listeria works. Oh, that's a awesome suggestion. I'm not. I haven't um, read that work, and I'm going to check it out right after this. Thank you. Okay, Bruce. Yeah, really nice talk, Abigail. Thanks so much. Um, I am curious, uh, your hydrogel formulation swells so much, I assume it's probably like a sodium polyacrylate or something that takes up a lot of water. I'm curious how changing the cross-link density, you mentioned toughening your gels, so maybe reducing the cross-link density and softening your gels so they're more extensible. How would that affect your experimental results and how could that be reflected in your model, especially with respect to like the tan delta of these gels? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of different... I think that I think the the route forward, which I'm 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 pursuing here at BU, is is in, if you if we want to be able to really connect between theory and experiment, we're going to be able need to find some knobs that we can tune, and I think the cross link density would be a great one. Uh, we are using really the simplest hydrogel model that we could, so we can tune the cross-link. Typically in that model, you tune the cross-link density by changing the effective number of chains. And so we could make that connection and see if it works. And if not, we could make a more complicated hydrogel model that includes some sort of viscoelasticity, like you're saying. Um, all of these things, I think, are how the, the things that we would need to start to be able to vary in order to, to close that loop. Uh, and I'm, I'm interested in doing it moving forward. Yeah, thank you for the question. <laughs> 